We were all sitting around the great big dining room table in my parents' dining room uh, many, many years ago, and we just finished eating our Easter dinner, and uh, we're about to slip into that you know, quiet turkey coma. You know what I'm saying? When you get done and you're just, you're so full, you way over eight, and, and now you're just ready to sleep for a couple hours before you go get seconds. Right? <laughs> right? And so we're all just kind of lying there and we're thinking, man, I'm, this is like, you know when you can't move, you got stitches, you're like, oh, I'm so full. And then my mom comes out with her homemade cheesecake. And we're all like, ooh, cheesecake. <laughs> like it, it just, it's like instantly you have some space, just a little bit, right? And so she brings it out, she puts it in the middle of the table, and we're all diving in, we're grabbing plates, we're trying, you know, carving out big chunks, putting them on the plate, and we're all getting, oh man, this is so good, and all this stuff, and, and uh, my brother's getting a plate, and all of a sudden we hear my nephew, who's all grown up now, but he was probably only about 9 or 10 at the time, he's just a little guy, he's sitting at the table and he says, can I have some? We're like, sure, here's a plate, put the thing, give him a fork. And we're getting them all set up. My brother comes back in the room, and as he's sitting down, he says, Johnny's never had cheesecake before. And we're all very interested now, because it's not very often you get to see somebody biting into heaven for the first time. (laughs) And so we're all sitting around, and all the eyes of this great big long table, you can just picture of it. I don't know, my grandmother was there, we had cousins there, we had, everybody was there, my brothers were there, their kids, it was, it was amazing. And we're all sitting around this table watching little Johnny, as Johnny goes, and he carves out, honestly, it was, it was way too big for his mouth when he, when he carved out, and he puts it on the fork, because that's how we're eating it, right? And he goes, and he stuffs it, and he forces it in, and it's so big, there's still cheesecake hanging out when he tries to close his mouth. And then he does, and then he does it. He's, he's in. And we're all watching as something really interesting happens. In one simultaneous motion, he bites down, his whole face scrunches up into this horrible prune of disgust, and he goes... <laughs> back down onto his plate. <laughs> I personally don't get it. <laughs> but you see, apparently, I've lost control here, apparently, your taste buds don't actually mature until you're in your early 30s. It's something I, I learned. I didn't know at the time. And until your taste buds actually mature, some things, like my mom's homemade cheesecake, can still be kind of gross. Apparently, that's, that's, that's the thing. That's his story anyway. Imagine all the things that we would miss out on if we never matured, if we never grew. We'd never learn how to drive a car. We would, we'd never maybe own our own home or get married and, and commit ourselves to someone for a lifetime. If we never grew up, if we never matured at all, we'd miss out on so much, wouldn't we? Well, the same is true about our spiritual life. If we never grow, if we're never to mature in our faith, then we miss out on so much. And that's why, beginning today and for the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a bit of a deeper dive into what it means to grow spiritually. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we grow in our faith. You see, we do a lot of things in the church that are really meant to mature us in our our spiritual formation or our, our, uh, our spiritual growth. You know, we do things like time alone with God's Word. We, we pray. We, do, uh, we, we have tithing. We have fellowship even, just to name a few. And all of these things are really meant to develop us in our spiritual maturity, in our growth, right? They're, they're to make us grow. Romans 8 and 29 says that from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him should become like his son. And while physical, intellectual, and emotional maturity are just that little thing that we call growing up, spiritual maturity is becoming like Jesus. And spiritual maturity is important because... Let's face it, just like we miss out if we don't mature physically, if we don't mature uh, spiritually, we're going to miss out on a bunch of stuff too. Remember in John 10.10, Jesus said, the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life 
and have it to the full. Some, some translations will say a more abundant life. He came that we would have a more abundant life. You see, there's all kinds of stuff out there that we don't necessarily see with our eyes. There's more going on than what we might notice at first. And the more we grow spiritually, the more we can see, the more we have access to. There's a more abundant life. It's a lifelong adventure, and we've got to do what we can to grow in this kingdom life and the power that we've been gifted with. So a long time ago, Christopher Reeve, you know, the real Superman? Uh, Christopher Reeve once said, I love this quote, he said, What makes Superman a hero is not that he has power, but that he has the wisdom and the maturity to use that power wisely. That's a great quote. You see, in a very similar way, our life in Jesus isn't just about the power that we have through him, but about having the wisdom and the maturity to use that power wisely. Spiritual maturity isn't just important, it's necessary for all of us. Now, we're going to discover a whole lot more about our spiritual growth when we get into our, our, uh, the four habits necessary for spiritual maturity in our, in our 201 class. You know, the, the classes I keep talking about over and over and over again? <laughs> but today I want to talk to you about three important facts that are going to help us on our journey of spiritual growth. The first is that spiritual growth is not automatic. It's not. It doesn't happen by accident. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, it says this, as you've been Christians for a long time now, and you ought to be teaching others, but instead you have dropped back to the place where you need someone to teach you all over again the very first principles in God's Word. You're like babies who can drink only milk, not old enough for solid food, and when a person is still living on milk, it shows that he isn't very far along in the Christian life and doesn't know much about the difference between right and wrong. He's still a baby Christian. So there are people in the church that, that they'll do this. They'll, they'll come in and they hang around, but they don't, they don't look to grow. Do you know the difference between being big and being grown up? It's maturity, isn't it? When we mature, we grow up. You grow physically and mature if you feed yourself with the right food, the right learning, and the right experiences. The same is true about your spirit. You will grow spiritually if you feed it with the right food, the right learning, and the right experiences. So we have all kinds of stuff. We've got like, Bible studies in small groups and men's groups and women's groups. And we've got you know, seminars and conferences. We've got men's breakfasts and you know, women's events, youth groups, all kinds of stuff that we do in the church. But maturing in your faith isn't just about attending a thing. I mean, it is. That's certainly part of it. But it's not just that. It's also about being intentional about living what Jesus teaches us. Now, I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard me say this, I don't know, a thousand times. But none of this happens by accident. No, no, you can't, can't be a Christian by osmosis, right? You don't get it just from, just from hanging around. If you're serious about your faith, you have to be intentional about your faith. Because the truth is, no one can do it for you. This is about putting one foot in front of the other, so to speak, as you walk down a path on a journey. Remember, a path will take you where you want to go, but you have to walk it. Yes? That's true in this world, and it's true in the kingdom of God. For many, many years, every summer, my father and I would take a, a camping trip. And what we did is we would go into the interior in Algonquin Park. We did it many, many times. It's gorgeous out there. But one year, we invited my baby brother, Daniel, and my, boy, uh, my childhood friend, Chris. That's a picture of me and Chris. I'm not going to tell you who's who. <laughs> we invited the two of them to join us on this, this camping trip, and it was pretty great. Now, one of the things that we did every time we took this trip is my father and I would take, uh, from our campsite, we would take uh, a further tour deeper into the interior through a chain of lakes to this natural water slide that was out there. And it was, I mean, it's stunning, absolutely gorgeous, and, and a lot of fun, too. And so on this particular trip, we decided that because we had the two, two canoes and we got four people, my baby brother Daniel would go with my father, and Chris, because he's my friend, would go with me. And I'm thinking, yeah, because Chris was into bodybuilding, right? 
He was big and he was really strong. And I'm thinking, this is going to be kind of like having an outboard motor on the front of my canoe, kind of just pulling me through the water, right? Hey, he was a lot stronger than I was. I'm like, I'm all excited. This is going to be great. And so we get in the boats and out we go. And we're paddling along, and about five minutes into a two to three hour canoe trip, Chris, he's paddling along, and he just, he takes his paddle out of the water, and he puts it on the gunnels, and he starts going like this. Now, to be fair, it's stunning, right? Like, I mean, it is gorgeous out there, but, but here I am in the back, <laughs> I'm paddling, and he just takes it, and he's looking around, and I, you know, I wanted to give him some time. It's the first time he's ever been out there, so I ignored it at first, and after a few minutes, he starts paddling again, and, and it was all good. But then after no more than a couple more minutes, he does it again. And this time I'm like, you know, Chris, we got a really long way to go. Uh, can you keep paddling while you look around? You, I mean, face it, we're in a canoe. We're not, we're not motoring by. There's lots of time to look around. Can you keep paddling while you look? And he waits a couple minutes, and then he starts paddling again. And I'm like, okay, whatever, like this. Eventually it happened. But then no more than five minutes goes by, and he does it again. And he takes it out, and now I'm getting frustrated because, <laughs> hey, Chris, <laughs> like, can you paddle while you look? It's like two hours of this, man. I can't keep doing this on my own. And, and he kind of looks back at me, and he nods, and he puts his paddle back in the water. And then two minutes later, and he keeps doing this. Hey, Chris. <laughs> This is going to take all day if you don't keep paddling. See, here's the thing about a big guy like that in the front of your boat. When he's paddling, it's awesome. When he's not, he weighs a ton. Like, it was horrible. It got so bad, in fact, that my father and my brother got so far ahead of us that they stopped, and my dad's yelling at Chris, Chris, start paddling, you got to catch up. And it kept happening and happening and happening until eventually I just couldn't do it anymore and I just put my paddle on the gunnels and I sat there. And we didn't move. And he's looking around for a couple minutes and then he goes to put his paddle back in the water but it's not really going anywhere. Right? Now <laughs> the tables are turned and we're just sitting there and he says, why aren't we moving? And I said, look man, uh, I can't paddle both of us all the way there. It's going to take all day. Either you do your part or we're just going to sit here. And he started paddling. <laughs> Your spiritual maturity doesn't happen by accident. It means you have to do it on purpose. No one, and I do mean no one, can do it for you. If you're not being intentional, you're not going to go anywhere. You have to put one foot in front of the other, or you have to put your paddle in the water. You have to actually do it. And this might mean connection that you may not have. We need to be connected. You have to be involved. We have to put in effort into this. This is a great place to start. Being here in Sunday service, coming together to worship with your church family is a great place to start. But honestly, it means more than just coming to a service on a Sunday. It's about plugging in and being part of a church family. It's about getting involved in maybe a small group or a Bible study to learn. It's about investing time into both your church family and into the, the community that we live in and love. It's definitely about practicing all those things that we learn from Jesus and about making those new habits who we are. So like I said, spiritual growth, it's not an accident. It's not automatic. Another thing we want to remember about spiritual growth is that it is a process. It's a process. It takes time. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You know, few things can be as frustrating as unmet expectations. So understanding that your, your spiritual formation, that spiritual growth in your life doesn't happen overnight, understanding that is actually going to help us be more confident in that journey of faith. Because there aren't any shortcuts. There aren't. Growing means change, and lasting change happens over time, doesn't it? There's a process to building spiritual maturity in your life. And if you don't go through the process or you try to cut corners, 
Well, the outcome can be disastrous. Does everybody know Ikea? Yeah, you all know Ikea. I grew up with Ikea. I love Ikea. I think Ikea is great. It's a whole lot of fun. They have so much, so much stuff. You can get almost anything there, but you have to put it together yourself, right? It's a lot of fun. You can go there. It's kind of like model building, actually, if you think about it. It's kind of like building models, only when you're done, you got furniture. That's pretty great. They have so much stuff there. In fact, I would guess that maybe a, a third of the furniture in our house came from Ikea at some point or another, and I got pretty good at this stuff. And one day, I got a call from one of our neighbors, and uh, she, she was having a real problem with something she bought at Ikea. So I went over to her place to pick it up, and I saw a disaster. You see, the thing about Ikea furniture is, uh, if you're really good at putting things together and following directions, it's great. If you're not, it's, yeah. So I go over to her place, and she's got this, uh, I think it was like a, a little uh, shelving unit with a drawer or something like that, and the whole thing is like, it's falling over, it's dying, it's about to collapse, and she doesn't know what's wrong. She's distraught. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm, really, I'm good with this thing. I've done so many Ikea things now, I can almost do them blindfolded. So I walked in, and I had a look at what she was doing, I picked up the manual, and I'm flipping through, and I'm looking around the room, and I noticed that her box is still on the floor, and there's pieces of wood sticking out of it. And I said, what are those? And she says, I don't know. They're extra. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> Pretty sure that's not what they are. And so we're looking through the manual together, and I flip the page, and she looks, and she goes, what is that? I don't remember seeing that. So she, <laughs> she had skipped the whole page. <laughs> and so we realized, man, she skipped this whole page. This thing's never going to go. We had to pull the whole thing apart and start over from scratch. And when we did, it came together and everything was all right. You know, in a similar way, when you're building up your spiritual maturity, when you're growing in your spiritual life, there aren't any shortcuts. You can't skip pages. Trying to cut corners or skip parts of the process only make things unstable and they make them shaky. Spiritual growth is a process. 2 Peter 3 and 8 says this, <clears throat> 3 and 18, sorry. Continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is ongoing. It's a process. It's a process that we all are a part of. So you have to be willing to take some time. Yeah, you got to be ready to do what's necessary in any given moment to grow spiritually. And it's going to involve some learning. It, it's going to involve change, at least some. It's going to involve plugging in and being part of a new life that is being offered you. It's a process, and so that means there is a place for you to start. Here at Smith Falls Free Methodist Church, we use our Christian Life and Service Seminars. These are these 101, 201, 301, 401 things I keep talking about all the time. We have these classes so that everyone starts on the same page. They start in the same place. And we do this so that we all know where we're at and we all know where we're going as well. And it keeps going from there on. Now the final fact I want to talk about today about spiritual growth is that it takes... Can you change the slide for me, please? It takes discipline. My phone's not working anymore. It's good. Now, I want you to remember that the word discipline here in the Scripture, the word where we, that we use in the Scriptures, rather, for, uh, for us, for those who follow Jesus, is a word disciple. We are disciples of Jesus. You heard that before, I hope? We are all disciples of Jesus. And that word comes from the Latin word discipulus. And discipulus means disciple. It means disciple learner. It is also the word, next slide, from which we get discipline. It takes discipline. See, discipline is an activity or an experience that provides training or learning. In 1 Timothy, or at least the latter part of 1 Timothy 4 and 7, it says this, take the time and the trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Be disciplined about it. In another translation, in the NASB, it says this, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. 
See, in our 201 class, we're going to talk a lot more about this because 201 class is really all about the four habits that are necessary for spiritual maturity. But one of the things that we're going to talk about in there is about this idea that as maturing believers, we are disciples. And we cannot be a disciple without being disciplined. That matters because it means that the more disciplined I become, the more God can use me. When we take the 201 class, we're going to talk a whole bunch more about how being a disciple is about developing those disciplined habits in our lives. Time with God's Word, prayer, tithing, fellowship, and more. Now, many years ago when I was apprenticing as a mechanic, uh, my boss used to say this thing to me all the time, and although very simple, it impacted me so much that it's kind of affected the rest of my life. And he said this, he said, anything that's worth doing is worth doing well. And in order to do something well, you must be disciplined to do it. And it just stuck. See, the truth is we are at war. But it's not against flesh and blood. We're at war, rather, against powers and principalities in the spiritual realm. And in this war, we experience a tug of war that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. He says this, So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. And we have to be disciplined because whatever it is that you feed in you is the thing that's going to grow and become strong. It reminds me of a story I heard once a long time ago about an old Cherokee who's teaching his grandson about life. And in it, he said, a fight is going on inside me, he told the boy. It's a terrible fight between two wolves. One wolf is evil. He's anger, he's envy, greed, arrogance, resentment, lies, pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, humility, Kindness, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside of you. The same fight is going, in, going on inside every other person, too. The grandson thought about the story for a moment, and he asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. Spiritual growth takes discipline because our enemy is working against us. Always. He doesn't want you to discover your purpose in the kingdom of God. He doesn't want you to mature in your faith. He doesn't want you to win. He doesn't want you to find out what this full life that Jesus talked about is really all about or what it looks like. He doesn't want you to be spiritually mature, so he's going to do everything he can to make it difficult for you, to distract you, to deceive you. So sometimes it's going to be challenging to do the things that Jesus asks us to do. So it's going to take effort. It's going to take focus. It's going to take support. And honestly, that's why we have each other, isn't it? Yeah? As we mature in our faith, we can be used for greater and greater things in God's kingdom. It's like I always say, the more tools you have in your toolbox, the more things you can build. Yeah. But as we continue to talk about spiritual growth in the weeks ahead, I want you to remember these three truths that we talked about today. That it's not automatic, that it is a process that we all go through, and that it will take discipline.